The sun was starting to dip, throwing long shadows across my new living room as I waded through a sea of cardboard and packing tape. The move happened suddenly, a necessary step towards a fresh beginning, and the walls still echoed with the vacancy of a space not yet imbued with memories. I'm Janet, a thirty-year-old who until today believed her life to be fairly routine. The jarring chime of the old-fashioned doorbell shattered the silence, jerking me from my thoughts. After wiping my hands on my jeans, I peeked through the peephole before swinging the door open. The hallway lay deserted, except for a vintage cradle that definitely hadn't been there this morning. Curled up inside, swaddled in a pale blue blanket, was a baby named John, a stranger to me at the time. Strangely, there was no one in sight, as if the baby had magically appeared on my doorstep. Balanced on the cradle's edge was an envelope, its cream-coloured surface slightly crumpled bearing my name in a familiar handwriting. My heart raced with a mix of fear and confusion as I tore the envelope open and unfolded the letter within. Dear Janet, the note began in Anna's hurried script. Anna, 35, not just my sister-in-law but a whirlwind of perplexing life choices. I'm sorry to leave John with you so suddenly. I'll explain when I return. Please take care of him. I gazed at the sleeping child, his breaths gentle and steady. John, just months old, already thrust into what felt like a covert operation. Why didn't Anna inform me of her visit? Didn't she know I'd moved? Questions swirled as I cradled the baby, a surge of protectiveness washing over me. The room seemed to shrink, the weight of responsibility bearing down. Determined for answers, I called Anna, met only with the chill of a voicemail, my message tinged with worry and frustration. With no reply, I headed to my old address. Perhaps, in her usual chaotic manner, Anna hadn't realized I'd moved, leaving John behind at my former home. The idea seemed absurd, but considering Anna's track record, it wasn't completely implausible. The drive there was nerve-wracking, my mind racing through possible scenarios of who might have discovered John if he was indeed at my former residence. Every red light felt like an eternity lost, each passing minute pulling John further away from safety. Pulling up to the once familiar doorstep now belonging to strangers, my heart sank. The new occupants, a couple perhaps in their late twenties, regarded me with puzzled eyes as I detailed my situation. Their bafflement matched my own, their disbelief crushing my fragile hope. As the harsh reality settled in, I realized this was more than a simple misunderstanding. With a heavy heart and a mind clouded with dread, I reached for my phone once again. It was time to involve the authorities. The day had slipped away rapidly, taking with it the peace I had known just hours before. Everything had shifted. The night air chilled my skin as I lingered on the porch of my former home, the fading chimes of the doorbell still echoing in my ears. Inside, the new occupants, a young couple, perhaps even younger than myself, listened with growing concern as I laid out my desperate situation. The woman's eyes widened with confusion, darting to the empty cradle beside me and then back to my anxious face. Her partner, arms crossed, leaned against the doorframe with skepticism etched on his features. They had no baby to report, no unexpected visitor besides the occasional solicitor. Could you please help me? I pleaded, the desperation clear in my voice but my words seemed to bounce off them, failing to sway their reluctance. With a polite but firm denial, they suggested I might be mistaken, that no child had been left on their doorstep. Their final suggestion, to contact the police, came with a hint of suspicion. Driving back to my new house, the empty cradle in the rearview mirror weighed heavily on my mind. The streets blurred past 
illuminated by streetlights casting long shadows across the dashboard. Each turn of the wheel felt mechanical, my thoughts consumed by the mystery surrounding John's disappearance. Arriving home offered no solace. The dimly lit living room only amplified my anxiety. I paced back and forth, the sound of my footsteps echoing in the silence. With trembling hands, I reached for my phone and dialed the local police station. Each ring felt like a heartbeat in my chest, the anxiety building with every passing second. Hello, police department, how may I assist you? I steadied my voice as I spoke, masking the turmoil raging within. I need to report a missing child, I stated firmly, though chaos churned inside me. The dispatcher's inquiries came one after another, demanding descriptions, times, and last known locations. I responded mechanically, laying out the details of the infant, the letter, and my recent relocation. Each revealed detail felt like a step towards solving the mystery or triggering a catastrophe. As I ended the call, the gravity of the situation draped over me like a heavy cloak. The impending arrival of the police promised a barrage of questions and inevitable scrutiny. Anna's unpredictability was not new to me, but this scenario delved into depths of recklessness I had never fathomed. I sank into a chair, attempting to steady my breath, while the digital clock on the microwave counted the late hours. Each passing minute was laden with the oppressive silence of the empty house. Thoughts of Anna flooded my mind, highlighting the intricacies of our relationship and the tangled web of deceit she had spun. I found myself ensnared, holding a thread that threatened to unravel at any moment. The cops are on their way, could mean the end of everything, or maybe the start of fixing it all. Sirens getting closer, tearing through this quiet neighborhood. I'm stealing myself. It's like a collision course, no turning back now. The clock's ticking, loud in the silence of my living room, with my tea long gone cold. Cops left an hour ago, but their questions are still hanging heavy in the air. My mind's racing back years ago, when Anna came into our lives, all vibrant and mischievous. She brought laughter, a carefree vibe that my brother Peter, now forty, fell for fast. Their whirlwind marriage held so much promise. But as time went on, cracks started showing in Anna's facade of charm and neediness. It all started with small favors, then turned into demands. Anna had this way of making her problems urgent, like only I could fix them. Janet, can you just handle this for me? She'd plead, urgency dripping from every word. These weren't mere requests, I mused, but summonses dragging me further into a whirlpool of obligation cleverly veiled as familial responsibility. Peter, always the peacemaker, often urged me to find the silver lining in her demands, I recounted. She means well, he'd argue, his judgment clouded by affection and a fervent desire for harmony. Our upbringing instilled in us a strong familial bond, I reflected, but even our late parents couldn't have foreseen the distorted interpretation Anna would bring into our sibling relationship. As the night deepened and the silence thickened, I pondered, I contemplated the extent of Anna's deceit. How many times had I reshuffled my life for her? How many plans had I abandoned? How many personal sacrifices had I made? Each instance served as a stark reminder of her invasive sway over my life, I realized and the arrival of baby John was just the latest move in Anna's manipulative game. A game that she played with a master's touch, leaving emotional chaos in her wake, I mused, reflecting on the turmoil she had caused. My involvement had been involuntary, a consequence of her manipulative skills, and now the stakes were higher than ever. As I sifted through the day's aftermath, a mix of resentment and worry clouded my mind. The police investigation will only raise more questions, exposing Anna's schemes, I thought with dread. It wasn't for myself that I feared exposure, but for Peter. 
He was a good man, ensnared by Anna's allure, blinded by love and loyalty. Tonight, however, her charms had faded, revealing the harsh reality of our predicament. The silence of the house amplified my thoughts, each one a heavy step in the labyrinth spun by Anna's deception. I knew the days ahead would demand a strength I wasn't sure I had. Confronting the truth about Anna and her actions felt like stepping into a furnace, where bonds could strengthen or trust could vanish entirely. Sitting there, darkness outside reflecting the turmoil within, I braced myself. It was more than a family feud. It was a battle for sanity and survival against one woman's relentless manipulation. Morning broke, light slipping through the blinds like silent sentinels marking time's passage. My sleep had been restless, haunted by dreams of shadows becoming cribs and echoing cries. Awake, the weight of reality pressed down like thick fog. At the kitchen table, coffee barely touching the heaviness in my chest, my phone buzzed. Peter's message arrived, urgent and pleading. His tone hinted at Anna's deepening manipulation, spreading like toxic roots. We met at a bustling cafe, a neutral haven amidst morning chaos. Peter looked weary, lines etched deeper, eyes shadowed by troubles. As we exchanged greetings, I felt a heavy tension hanging between us, pregnant with unspoken words. Peter began, his voice barely audible over the bustling noise around us. Janet, it's about Anna. She's been using John to manipulate us all. I listened intently, feeling my heart sink with each revelation. Anna had taken her schemes to a new level, exploiting her own son to further her agenda. Peter detailed how she had resorted to threats of taking John away, isolating him from everyone unless her demands were met. These were not mere empty threats, but carefully calculated moves aimed at causing maximum distress and extracting concessions. The sheer audacity of her actions left me stunned, forcing me to confront a truth I'd been avoiding. Anna wasn't just a nuisance. She posed a genuine danger, her behavior no longer tolerable or dismissible. She's managed to convince everyone that I'm neglecting her, that our lack of support is causing her struggles. Peter continued, his voice trembling with emotion. But it's all a facade, Janet. She's crafting this narrative to manipulate and control us all. The bustling cafe around us faded into insignificance as Peter's words sank in. The realization that Anna had spun such an intricate web of deception, capable of tearing our family apart, filled me with a mix of anger and fear. She's been scheming, Janet, Peter murmured, using John as a pawn to maintain her grip on control. If she goes with him, his voice trailed off, unable to voice the painful outcome. We sat in silence, each lost in our thoughts. The ramifications of Anna's actions extended far beyond a mere family dispute, poisoning every interaction and memory with suspicion and doubt. It was evident that this was not merely a domestic squabble, but a meticulously planned emotional onslaught. As we parted ways, a determination solidified within me. The situation demanded more than passive observation or hesitant involvement. It necessitated action, a direct confrontation with the truth of Anna's manipulation. Failure to act would mean not only the disintegration of our family, but also the loss of John to Anna's relentless ambition and deceit. The journey home was solemn, the city streets and sounds muted by the turmoil within. Today had shifted something fundamental in my perception of Anna and us. Today, I wasn't just an aunt or a sister. I was a protector of my family's future, even against one of our own. The afternoon sky mirrored the turmoil in my heart, a bruised mix of greys and blues. As I sat at my desk, surrounded by the mundane clutter of everyday life, 
Each item seemed insignificant compared to the weight of the decision looming ahead. I stood at the edge of a choice that could either unravel the fragile threads holding my family together or weave them into a stronger bond. The phone call earlier in the day from Detective Larson had been a jolt, pulling the situation with Anna from a private nightmare into the stark light of legal scrutiny. We need to discuss some new developments, he said, his voice a blend of professionalism and underlying urgency. The meeting was set for late afternoon at the precinct, a place of stark walls and echoes where truths were laid bare. As I drove to the station, the weight of every conversation with Anna, every manipulated moment, pressed down on me. The air in the car felt thick, each breath a labour. The closer I got, the more my nerves frayed, unravelling with the thread of every thought that wove through my mind. Detective Larson met me at the entrance, his expression unreadable. We walked through the narrow corridors to a small room where the air was stale, the kind of place where countless dramas had unfolded, none of them good. He motioned for me to take a seat, and as I settled in, the chair felt more like a jury's verdict. Miss Johnson, there's a twist in the tale about Anna and the kid, he started, shuffling papers like they were clues to unravel. We've got enough to suspect Anna's been plotting to use John against you and Mr. Peter Johnson. The words hit me like a sledgehammer. It wasn't just doubt anymore. It was a confirmed truth. My hands shook a bit, betraying the composure I struggled to maintain. Detective Larson pressed on, outlining intercepted messages and stories from others ensnared by Anna's machinations. Each revelation shattered the image of Anna I clung to, leaving behind a portrait of a schemer, willing to manipulate her own child. We're also looking into John's paternity, which might be a motive for her actions, he added, his eyes scrutinizing my every reaction. I felt numb, the room spinning as implications wove their own narrative. The possibility of deeper deceit layered onto an already tangled web was staggering. As I grappled with this, my phone buzzed insistently on the table. It was Peter, his message blunt. Janet, it's about Anna. She's made a move. We need to act now, I urgently informed Detective Larson, showing him the message. I think it's time we bring her in for a conversation, he replied, rising from his seat. It's imperative we address this before she goes any further. As we exited the room, determination weighed down my steps. The impending storm was upon us, and I found myself at its center. The drive back was charged with tension, a prelude to the inevitable confrontation ahead. No longer a mere bystander, I embraced my role as a catalyst, prepared to confront Anna and unravel the web of deceit. The truth, though messy, demanded to be uncovered, for the sake of an innocent child and a family in need of healing. Amidst the bustling airport crowd, my focus remained unwavering, fixed on Anna. Guided by Detective Larson's intel, I approached the moment of reckoning. Peter stood beside me, a silent reminder of the gravity of our mission. With every heartbeat, I felt the weight of the task ahead, echoed by the rhythmic tapping of Peter's foot against the polished floor. We'd gotten wind that Anna might be trying to skip town, likely with John, who'd been mysteriously AWOL from her last known address. The sense of betrayal wasn't just personal, it hung heavy casting a chill over what used to be our tight-knit family. Amidst the hustle of travellers, our focus narrowed to the looming showdown. Gate 24, I muttered, double-checking the message. Peter nodded, his expression steely, scanning the crowd for any sign of his estranged wife. The tension between us crackled like live wire, charged with the anticipation of confrontation. Taking our position near the designated gate, we blended into the surroundings, 
ready for action. The incessant drone of the public announcements barely registered as we remained on high alert. Then, there she was, Anna, cradling John, the picture-perfect image of a devoted mother to the casual observer. But we knew better. We saw past the facade, recognizing the desperation and calculated risks beneath her charade, using her son as a shield and a bargaining chip. Beside me, Peter stiffened, his distress evident. Let's move, he whispered, our advance purposeful. Anna's eyes widened as she spotted us, a hint of panic flickering before she plastered on a forced smile. Peter, Janet, what a surprise. She greeted, her voice steady, though her grip on John tightened. The mention of John stirred something in my heart. This boy, unexpectedly thrust into the center of our family's turmoil, was now under my wing. Peter and I had agreed that I would take the lead in caring for him while Peter dealt with the aftermath of his broken marriage. As I left the detention center, the weight of our conversation hung heavy in the air. Forgiveness felt like a distant shore, visible but just out of reach. Back home, John served as a constant reminder of the consequences of Anna's decisions. His laughter, reminiscent of lost innocence, filled the silence. I found myself becoming more protective, tapping into maternal instincts I never knew I had. And then there was my own revelation, a twist of fate adding another layer to our already complex lives. I was expecting a child. The news brought a rush of emotions, each one reflecting my hopes, fears, and growing love for the little one soon to join our chaotic world. As winter approached, the days grew colder, each falling leaf a reminder of life's ever-changing cycles. We were all finding our way through the aftermath of Anna's actions, the path ahead wasn't straight or easy, but it was ours to tread, offering the chance for fresh starts and valuable lessons from the past. As winter gave way to the gentle push of spring, the world around my small budding family started to thaw, both literally and figuratively. Sitting on the porch, watching John explore the emerging greenery of the garden, I could almost believe that the chaos of the past year was just a fading memory. Almost. These months hadn't been easy. The house, once silent except for my own footsteps, now echoed with the lively sounds of a toddler discovering his surroundings and the quieter, profound rhythms of my own pregnancy. I was often exhausted, but it was the satisfying kind of tiredness that comes from creating something meaningful. John, now wobbling across the yard, brought constant joy and a poignant reminder of why the struggle had been so important. His laughter was infectious, a pure and untroubled sound that could bring both a smile to my lips and a tear to my eye, a testament to the innocence of his youth and the complexity of his origins. Peter visited frequently, our relationship, strained and tested by the challenges with Anna, settled into a new rhythm, characterized by a shared dedication to John and an acknowledgement of our shared pain and resilience. His divorce was finalized, closing a chapter in the messiest way imaginable, but he was healing, finding his path back to a life reshaped by truth. Anna's presence lingered, even though she was physically absent, serving her time, and, from what little I heard, tentatively embarking on her own journey toward redemption. We're aware of everything, Anna, I declared, my words laden with both sorrow and determination. The deceit, the manipulation, it stops here. Her facade crumbled, her composure unraveling as she realized the game was up. You don't comprehend, she began. But Peter interjected, We comprehend more than enough. It's finished, Anna. You're not taking John. The exchange caught the attention of a few bystanders, and sensing the tension escalating, I subtly signaled to the nearby security personnel, 
who were already on alert for potential trouble. Approaching us, the officer's presence was a necessary intervention. Is there an issue here? One of them inquired, his tone authoritative yet composed. Anna's defiance seemed to falter, her shoulders slumping as she glanced between the officers and us. The only option left for her now was the truth. I wanted a better life for him, she murmured softly, almost to herself. It's not solely about your desires, Peter responded, his voice carrying a blend of anger and empathy. It's about what's best for John. Sensing the personal nature of the conflict, the officers suggested we continue our conversation in private. In a secluded room provided by airport security, Anna's narrative unfolded, revealing a tale of fear, desperation, and deception. At the heart of her turmoil lay John's paternity, a secret driven by an affair that had spiraled beyond her control. As the truth spilled forth, the path to resolution became clearer. Anna would deal with the fallout from her actions, both legally and personally. As for John, we hashed out interim custody arrangements with Peter, pending further legal proceedings. Exiting the airport, the weight of the day's revelations hung between us, heavy, yet somehow cleansing. We had weathered the storm, and though the waters were still choppy, the way forward felt clearer, driven by the needs of an innocent child ensnared in the fallout of adult mistakes. The resolution wasn't tidy, nor did it signal the end of our battles, but it marked a beginning, a stride toward healing and, perhaps one day, forgiveness. The autumn breeze carried a sharper bite this year, slicing through city streets with an urgency that mirrored the upheavals in our family's life. Since the airport confrontation, weeks had slipped by, each day bringing its own trials and small triumphs. The world around me marched on, heedless of the seismic shifts within the once tranquil confines of our home. Anna's legal proceedings commenced in the stark, sterile environment of the courtroom, a jarring contrast to the emotional chaos that had led us there. She faced charges of child endangerment and fraud, her past deceptions unravelling under the legal microscope. Her once dynamic presence, brimming with vitality and manipulation, now seemed subdued, confined by the harsh realities of her predicament. The divorce proceedings were a mere formality, yet they reopened old wounds for Peter. He sat beside me, his visage etched with the profound lines of someone who had loved too fiercely and blindly. His faith, once bestowed upon Anna with such abandon, now lay shattered, and he grappled with the aftermath, searching for a way to reconstruct amidst the emotional wreckage. In the wake of it all, Anna became a mere echo of her former self, her days consumed by legal battles and the stark realization of her solitude. Her once vibrant social circle, a rich tapestry of companionship and admiration, dwindled as the truth of her actions spread. The community's whispers, once background murmurs, now swelled into a chorus of judgment and reproach. I paid her a visit once, driven by a complex mix of familial duty and an insatiable need to comprehend why. We sat opposite each other in the visiting room of the detention centre, a pane of glass dividing us, a barrier as much emotional as physical. Janet, Anna's voice was raspy, devoid of its former flamboyance, replaced by something raw and authentic. I never imagined it would come to this. None of us did. I responded gently, the bitterness that had fueled my earlier actions giving way to a weary resignation. Actions have consequences, Anna. You chose this path. She nodded, tears welling but not yet spilling, a dam restraining a reservoir of remorse. I know. I just... I hope one day you can forgive me. Not for me, but for John. I hadn't seen her since our last visit at the detention center, but she wrote occasionally, letters filled with remorse and reflections that I read with mixed emotions. 
Forgiveness was a distant goal I was still striving for, not yet in sight, but perhaps not as far away as it once seemed. In these quiet moments of contemplation, I often pondered the life growing inside me, wondering about the world he or she would enter. It was a world I hoped would be shaped not by the shadows of past mistakes, but by the light of fresh beginnings and the wisdom gained from lessons learned. I yearned to create a haven, a haven of unconditional love and safety, where the scars of betrayal and manipulation would not linger. My musings were frequently interrupted by the realities of the present, John's laughter as he chased a butterfly, or the gentle kicks of the baby reminding me of the life I carried within. These were my lifelines, drawing me away from the brink of past regrets and propelling me toward the promise of tomorrow. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long golden shadows over the garden, a profound sense of tranquility enveloped me.